Good afternoon everyone, my name is Benjamin and welcome to another video and before I get into it uh, I want to say uh, thanks y'all for tuning in and uh, likes, comments, subscriptions, they always do help and I greatly appreciate everyone who already has and uh, I look forward to uh, continued growth, uh, seriously, y'all have uh, really made, made me a lot bigger than I ever thought I would get, so anyway. It's turning out that this is turning into SCOTUS week on my channel. I may actually just have to continue doing uh, do this and make it a yearly thing like uh, Shark Week or something. I don't know. Um, and today I want to give a bit of a brief overview of the different judicial philosophies that a judge in any of our federal courts, but especially the Supreme Court, can take. Um... And by the way, this is uh, before Kavanaugh was confirmed uh, to the court. Because I see Gorsuch up there, I do not see Kavanaugh. So, anyway, let's get back to it. Um, <laughs> the first one is the so called living constitution interpretation, which basically goes that because the constitution was written so long ago, and the fact that the meaning of a lot of phrases and even words in the English language are constantly changing, we need to continuously update our understanding of the Constitution to be more in line with our own present legal understanding as well as the current culture and political environment of the day. In addition, we should interpret the Constitution to give both broad powers to the government, but also potentially broad powers to the people with regards to civil liberties, as well as a more democratic understanding of the provisos within the Constitution. So a more open or liberal interpretation, for those who want to use that word, uh, of the document to allow, again, like I said, more broad powers to be granted to the government, but also can be used to argue for greater civil liberties. And there's nothing wrong with, you could argue there isn't anything wrong with this philosophy from a uh, building ground, right, for, from a foundation. It's when you apply it in how you apply it, as well as the consistency in your application. Because somebody could use this to argue for some very broad civil liberties and be uh, more libertarian in their philosophy with a this supposed with this living constitution. However, the flip side is that they can become quite authoritarian with this living constitution side, <laughs> um, but they can also add in and change the meaning of the Constitution to include things that the Founders probably never even thought about, as well as things that the Founders maybe didn't think were reasonable to allow, but thought that no reasonable person ever would consider this allowable in any circumstance, so there's no need to even put it in there. I mean, that was, of course, the Founders' argument for uh, for not including the Bill of Rights in the Constitution itself and, requ and it requiring uh, the passage of the Bill of Rights as amendments to the Constitution. Right? That was... The Federalists argued that no one's going to take away these rights. We don't need a Bill of Rights. Whereas the Anti-Federalists were like, uh, are you kidding me? People are going to misread this, and they're going to think the government can regulate all of these things. We need to pass legal protection in the form of the Constitution in this contract with the American people to ensure that these rights are not taken away. It's kind of hilarious the more and more I read the Anti-Federalist Papers, or I guess reread them, and reread the Federalist Papers, the, the more I start realizing that the Anti-Federalists hit the nail on the head 
with the biggest truth hammer that could ever be swung. They pointed out all the flaws in the document, and they were right almost every single time. It's scary, actually, <laughs> how correct the anti-federalists were. <laughs> um, but anyway, the other argument is going to be broadly speaking called a textualist argument, and there are a few subsets. A textualist is going to say, no, the wording is the wording, and that's that. And they're going to say, because the wording is the way it is, we must interpret it with the strictest considerations being made. We must put strict constraints, therefore, on what we view as legal or not within the Constitution. This can, of course, be applied, you know, in a lot of interesting ways, both arguing for and against certain types of provisions that you would think, well, textualists are going to be conservative, but not necessarily. You could make a textualist argument for the limitation of free expression if you take one of the sub variations of textualism. For example, somebody who believes that the founders meant when they wrote in peaceable assembly was that the First Amendment, broadly speaking, was that the First Amendment was speaking, of course, about peaceful expression, not necessarily any sort of expression. And therefore, you could say, if they are trying to incite riot, or basically, to quote a Supreme Court decision, um, if you shout fire in a crowded building, this would not be considered protected, uh, protected speech. You could argue that that would be a textualist interpretation, because you could say that, well, yeah, they said peaceable assembly, they didn't say peaceful speech, but you could argue that that extends to all of the rights enumerated in the First Amendment, that the government cannot legislate away. You know, Congress shall make no law abridging, this means they already considered it in existence. But anyway, however, you could also argue from an originalist standpoint or even a textualist standpoint that all speech is free speech, regardless of what it is. And that's where you get people who are absolutist when it comes to free speech. Of course, originalists, their whole thing is not just taking the word of, you know, in the Constitution as is. What they will do is they will try to find the original intent of the people who wrote each uh, article, section, um, amendment, through the use of primary sources, specifically debate um, notes from, say, James Madison, or the record of the debates over ratification of the Constitution, the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers, um, letters between politicians of the day who wrote the Constitution or its various amendments um, and stuff like that to find out what the original intent was what was each specific point meant to mean and meant to do if that makes any sense right And the reason why some people would favor a textualist approach is to use the metaphor of the Constitution being a contract between the American people and a potential government, because the Constitution isn't the law of the land regarding what the people can do. It's actually the charter for the government that we currently uh, have here in the United States. It is the charter saying what their powers and obligations are. 
not the government saying this is what we can do and this is what rights the people have. It's actually kind of the other way around is the people saying these are the rights the government has and you can't take these rights away specifically. <laughs> it's, it's one of the few constitutions to ever do this and especially outside of North America. And it's, when I say North America, I actually kind of specifically mean uh, the United States and sort of Canada, sort of. So you could argue that from a contractual standpoint, you can't really change the meaning of any of the phrases, words, sections, clauses, whatever, because that would be like me signing a contract with a neighbor to say water their uh, water their flowers every day, and then all of a sudden, the popular definition of watering something turns into uh, uh, urinating on it. And then all of a sudden I decide that because the new meaning is that, I don't actually have to uh, you know get a uh, little pitcher and pour you know clean pure water over my neighbor's flowers. Instead I can just you know drink a lot of water and then do the deed on them, right? So that would be a uh, an originalist and a textualist argument for why you really should never use the idea of a living constitution because if you change the meaning of the words and the phrases they lose all meaning these of say the uh, various provisions within the Constitution mean whatever you want them to mean at that current moment in history, then they lose all meaning because somebody further on down the line can change it to mean whatever they want it to mean or whatever the definition in that era is, if that makes any sense. Whereas using te pure textualism and originalism, you won't change the meaning and therefore you have consistency and order and even if you do arrive at the same point and conclusion as somebody who believes in the living constitution an originalist's precedent can never be overturned if everybody uses that originalist or that textualist's precedent because the only way to overturn it is to change the meaning and a good example of this would be someone looking at the 13th 14th and 15th amendments when it says equal protection under the law plus E.V. Ferguson used a living definition to argue that segregation was constitutional because separate but equal as long as the facilities were truly were, were equal you know same space uh, same facilities uh, same, same amenities all that stuff you could segregate however in Brown v. Board they used an originalist explanation as well as a pure textualist interpretation and said that separate is inherently unequal and this was echoed by Neil Gorsuch when he voted with the liberal justices to include LGBT protections within the Civil Rights Act because he said that discrimination based off of sexuality is inherently discrimination based off of sex or gender. That is why textualism, in my opinion, is far superior. Because you can trace every single point. And you don't have to find uh, some sort of justification based off of 
a modern interpretation that 30, 40 years down the line may change again. I tried to avoid going into opinion on this and just explanation, but the truth is I do admittedly know more about how originalism and textualism works, especially with regards to the fact that it requires extreme in, extremely in-depth research. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Um, take it easy, y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed. See you next time. Bye-bye.